morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, Bay Work uh, Training Buffet. Um, the, my name is Elizabeth Toops. I'm the uh, Bay Work Manager, uh, and I'm happy to have you all here this morning virtually. Um, this morning, we're going to talk about um, plastics. Uh, and as we so, um, know, so well know, that it is a material of, of a thousand uses, and some of those are good, and some of those are not so good. Um, and we're, uh, we're um, pleased to have uh, Sue Murphy from Solano Irrigation District joining us to talk about um, uh, her work um, in this area. Um, so um, uh, in, um, before kicking it off to Sue, just another reminder that if you um, haven't already, please add your, please, please introduce yourself by adding your name, uh, agency affiliation, your title uh, to the chat. So we have a sense of um, who's in the room. Take it away, Sue. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm glad to have this opportunity to talk with you today. Um, my name is Sue Murphy. I'm the Water Quality Coordinator at Solano Irrigation District. We operate nine public water systems, uh, half for surface water and half for groundwater. So we have all the challenges of both. And um, give you a little bit of my background. I'm the chemist on staff. and. I'm a Sacramento native and I started wanting uh, to work for the Dirty Dozen polluting companies in Sacramento when I grew up and I had uh, an opportunity to do quite a bit. I uh, started off with uh, Sacramento rendering and pr producing meat and bone meal and tallows and greases and went to the solid propellant lab at Aerojet and then the pesticide residue lab at Campbell Soup. And, uh, decided to take environmental courses and went to work for international environmental consulting firm, doing a lot of uh, large Department of Defense remedial investigations and finally saw the light and went into drinking water. And so some of the information I'm going to share with you today is meant to be resources so that whatever your background is, whatever your interests are, uh, you could uh, get involved in the technical aspects of the analyst analyzing the samples or uh, any part of the process. So we'll start with what I hope to cover today. Um, the basic background in plastics, some of the health effects, some of the costs and the size of the problem. And as soon as I started putting the materials together, I realized that uh, these are huge topics that you could spend hours talking about each one of them. So I just wanted to kind of share with you how I got started and maybe that would interest you in uh, checking out some of these resources. So it started back in June, really. I've always had an eye towards emerging contaminants and algal toxins and uh, PFAS and PFOS and um, really, I wasn't thinking about plastics too much. And then I saw this uh, program for uh, ELAP's second conference. And I know we all have a limited time for learning like today. And I don't usually follow CSEA, which is the California Society of Environmental Analysts. We don't have an in-house lab. We use a contract lab. And uh, over the years, I've seen both sides from inside and outside the lab, but I have always kept an eye on ELAB, the Environmental Lab Accreditation Program. Even 20 years ago, uh, when I worked for other companies, I would go to their meetings in Berkeley and hear what they were discussing uh, about regulations of laboratories. So even when I don't go to a conference, I always pick the sessions I would go to when I review the agenda. Even with this Bay work, I look through the whole program and pick the ones that if I had all the time I would go to. And it helps you to learn who the speakers are. And, and sometimes I'll think a session is great and it won't be exactly what I expected. And other times I think, oh, I don't know about that session and it'll turn out to be a great one. So I've learned that you can't always tell, but this is one of the best conference programs I've ever seen. And this was their second year. And I'm really sorry I missed the first year, but the good thing about it is I just went before uh, the session today to their website, CSCA, and they have the conference and every session 
available to be viewed much like they work does after the fact. So anything that you see related to it, you can go and here's a couple of uh, parts that I would really highly recommend. Their first and last speaker were awesome. <laughs> And I was so glad to have such great keynote speakers. And a lot of times that really draws people to conferences. So the first speaker was Captain Charles Moore. And at the time, I hadn't really heard about him at all. And he is a very enthusiastic speaker and certainly an expert in his field. And he was speaking about his experience of over two decades uh, in the ocean uh, with the great garbage patch and some of the uh, projects that he's been involved with. And he's been on all these famous shows and engaged by Encyclopedia Britannica to give the definition of plastic pollution for their online edition. And he really turns out to be a pretty amazing guy. He talked for about 15 minutes and I re looked at the first part of it and wanted to watch the whole thing again because it's just that interesting. The last speaker of the conference uh, was Robert Brownwood that some of you might uh, recognize as being the uh, previous um, San Francisco DDW uh, district engineer before he moved over to Sacramento where he's a assistant deputy director uh, with DDW now. And he was a very interesting speaker and his, uh, session is also available on their website. And one of the things that I find uh, super interesting is that he started off with uh, as a regulator, but then he went to the city of Tulsa and gained a lot of real world experience, which then he brought back to California and has been very much involved in changes to the uh, laboratory uh, programs. So, Captain Moore wrote a book, Plastic Ocean, that he talked about in his presentation. And as I frequently do, it doesn't take much to get me to buy a book. So I tapped in for Amazon to drop it off at my house so it would be waiting for me when I got home. And one of the things that I do because I have a very long commute is I go back and forth between listening to books and reading them. And so I brought some uh, visual aids today. Here's my autographed copy of Plastic Ocean that I got on eBay. And these books are available for just like two or $3. They're really inexpensive uh, use, some of the ones that have been out. And then uh, another thing that I found was this plastic toy that's filled with a lot of plastic pieces. And then you have to find 30 items that are hidden in there. And what I use this for is to keep people busy when I'm on the phone and they stop by my office. And also it's an icebreaker to get people to start talking about the subject and then they share what they know and uh, they can tell what is interesting to me these days. Then I picked up a couple of other books on garbology and tracking trash. And so I just try to inform myself and read, read, read when I get interested in a new subject. And I would highly recommend uh, any, uh, especially um, Captain Moore's book. So I wanted to do a little basic background on the history of plastics. And I brought my eight ball as uh, a reminder that it really started back in 1862 when people were looking for an alternative to cue balls uh, that weren't made of ivory. And this person, Alexander Parks, introduced the first ever man-made plastic. And of course he named it after himself. I thought that was interesting that if I invent something, I might name it after myself. And then shortly after that, celluloid was invented, which became the first financially successful plastic product. And then uh, that was celluloid and then cell cell cellophane was invented shortly after that. And the advantage from that is that it can be made into thin transparent sheets, which we still see today, which is ideal for food packaging. And I have the dates mixed up, but Bakelite was the first fully synthetic plastic, meaning that it contained no molecules found in nature. 
And I have some friends that collect Bakelite and items made out of that. Polyvinyl chloride was invented and it became one of the most widely produced plastic products in the world and still is. 1925, the term plastic is introduced. It comes from the Greek word plastikos, which means capable of being shaped or molded. Then we have plexiglass and lucite being introduced into eyeglasses and uh, products that you can see through. Phenol and formaldehyde were combined to make polyethylene, to make grocery bags and shampoo bottles and bulletproof vests. And you can still see this is really before uh, World War II. And then styrofoam was one of the later ones to be introduced. And a lot of these materials were used in the war effort. And then after the war, then they became used for the general public and just exploded in their use. And that's been known as the plastic century, uh, which has brought convenience and cost effectiveness, but created staggering environmental problems. Uh, the packaging was designed to be single use and some plastics take centuries to decompose. From the Ocean Conservancy, uh, here are some top 10 items collected. I was a little surprised to to learn that cigarette butts are the number one item. And the problem with that is that they contain a lot of the nicotine and carcinogens in tobacco. And when they get into the water, they leach out those other chemicals. And then plastic bottles as we would expect and straws. And I even felt so bad about the use of straws that I always keep with me a couple of aluminum straws and never ask for any straws anymore. That's a, just a little thing that I've done. So let's discuss what are microplastics. They're tiny pieces of plastic, smaller than five millimeters in it, and at least one external dimension. They're pollutants that are observed in every setting ever examined, including remote locations like the Arctic. Uh, it's a worldwide trillion dollar industry with an annual production of 400 million metric tons in 2020, and it's expected to grow to over 1.1 billion tons by 2050. And don't forget that plastic additives like flame retardants, plasticizers, and dyes are part of the structure. And all of these are transferred up food chains. Plastics are polymers, engineered chains of repeated small hydrocarbon building blocks. And into this matrix are 10,000 registered additives and processing agents like bisphenols, phthalates, and brominated fire retardants that are not even evaluated for toxicology. Over 1,200 have been identified as substances of high concern. Plastics are persistent with half-lives measured in centuries. It is expected that water utilities will seek to recover cost upgrades for treatment from the plastic industry once there is a current data. So I was thinking of plastics in the ocean. And then in October, in the middle of October, I read this article in the San Francisco Examiner. And I really was surprised by how quickly this became like the number one subject matter of interest in drinking water. We're just getting ready to start UCMR5 and nobody's been even talking about microplastics, but the State Water Resources Control Board or California uh, approved requirements for the testing of microplastics in drinking water in the 30 largest water providers uh, in California in their source water starting next year, which is, you know, just weeks away. And it's the first government agency in the world to do so. So it's not just California, it's not just the United States, it's the world that they're really breaking ground. So in the Bay Area, which you guys and myself uh, are, uh, the large industries or the large utilities, excuse me, San Francisco PUC, East Bay Mud, and Santa Clara 
<coughs> are going to be ramping up programs to test their source water for microplastic. <coughs> Excuse me. Researchers who fed microplastics to mice found adverse changes to their gut, liver, and kidney tissues, oxidative stress, <coughs> altered metabolisms, and chronic inflammation. A decline in reprodu reproductive health was also observed, resulting in lower sperm counts and decreased motility. And here's a quote from the same article where Bob Brownwood said, perspective's critical. Though studies have shown that a large majority of drinking water samples contain microplastics, research has found that people who drink bottled water exclusively may be ingesting an additional 90,000 microplastic particles annually compared with 4,000 particles for those who drink from the tap. So I think that was supposed to be a little reassuring, but I'm still thinking about the 4,000 particles from the tap. And then he says, when you buy that plastic bottle of water, every time you open and shut the cap, you're shearing off microplastics into your drink. And the second I read that, I decided I was no longer going to drink uh, Diet 7-Up out of the bottle, but from now on, I'll be drinking it out of the can. And I'm pretty sure if I read about cans, I might find something there that I need to think about. Uh, we absolutely have to be concerned, but you're probably drinking more microplastics in one soda than you would in a thousand gallons of water from your tap. Glass is the safest water bottle type. And that's one of the reasons it's used all the time in the laboratory because it's unreactive. And uh, stainless steel offers insulation benefits that keep your beverages hot or cold. And here's my most recent stainless steel uh, mug. Now to talk a little bit about the health effects of plastics. We mentioned some of them earlier. It's really a cocktail of risks that include endocrine disrupting chemicals, which are linked to infertility, obesity, diabetes, frost, prostate or breast cancer and others. Uh, it's also linked to uh, additives that uh, include autism, early puberty, uh, cognitive impairment and neurodevelopment disorders. And as we mentioned before, I mentioned before, Cigarette butts are the number one most littered item on earth. They're made from cellulose acetate. Microplastics are tiny enough to get into our food chain. They've been found in drinking water, apples, broccoli, carrots, lettuce, seafood, and more. I found a reference that said that apples have 100, 200,000 microparticles per gram and broccoli was 100,000 microparticles per gram. And one of the reasons that these vegetables had more than others is thought to be because they take up a lot of water in their roots. They're more um, the types of products that use a lot of water. This was a picture that I saw that represents how the plastic particles kind of embed themselves into the body of animal or fish in this case. And they did some studies where they had see-through fish and they could actually see like this, the colors of the different particles in the different parts of the fish. Microplastics have been found in humans, in the uh, lungs and the blood and the stool which means that we are ingesting and breathing in these dangerous chemicals. Um, how much microplastics do we consume, uh, consume? New research combining the results of more than 50 studies globally has found that on average, people could be ingesting about five grams of plastic every week, equivalent to a credit card, uh, which now when I look at my uh, debit card, I think plastics. It's in the air that we breathe, the food we eat, and, and especially the water we drink. Um, microplastic particles can accumulate uh, PCBs and other chemicals that are linked to even more harmful health effects. Uh, various cancers, weakened immune system, reproductive problems, 
And once these chemicals are inside of us, even low doses may have an effect. Uh, the participants could have been exposed through the air, the water, and the food, but also through personal care products like toothpaste or lip gloss that might have been accidentally ingested. Uh, dental polymers, parts of implants, or tattoo ink residues. Here are some routes of exposure. A lot of clothes have microplastic particles in them that after they're washed, they go out of the washing machine to the wastewater plant. Medicines have uh, microparticles in them. The dust, I was reading about tires when they're on the road wearing off some of the materials in the tire, <clears throat> those get up into the air, cosmetics and food. We can ingest or inhale, or even in some cases, thermally absorb um, the materials and same uh, outcomes of particle toxicity, oxidative stress, inflammation. They can move once they get into the body, into the bloodstream to other areas. And they do have uh, some relation to some cancers. Uh, microplastics have been detected in 80% of the people tested. I didn't like this. Uh, we already knew that humans ingest and inhale microplastics up to five grams per week. Uh, since a new process to detect plastic microparticles accumulated in the human body was accepted by the scientific community in 2020, <clears throat> Studies confirm shocking conclusions that uh, they've been detected in human blood of 80% of the people tested. Uh, they were discovered in the lungs of 11 out of 13 sample surgery patients, which to me, 11 out of 13, those are small numbers. They can be found in the intestines, uh, placentas of fetuses and newborns. They're basically found everywhere they look. And one of the challenges has been the ability to to test for them. And as you can see here, you know, they're still developing methods to analyze these types of compounds. They're very challenging uh, and very small amounts that make them um, a challenge to detect. Here was an article on plastics or glass baby bottles that microplastics were 10 times higher in the feces of babies compared with adults. And it was thought that that was because they're fed entirely with some cases plastic bottles and are swallowing millions of microparticles a day. Uh, the polypropylene bottles tested make up 82% of the world market with glass bottles being the main alternative. And polypropylene is one of the most commonly used plastics. And preliminary tests have found that kettles and food containers also produce millions of microplastics per liter of liquid. Sometimes when I go to my sister's house or my friends, they're putting plastics in the microwave. And I've always had a bad feeling. I don't do that myself. I make sure that I always transfer it to a, a glass container. Uh, now there's probably more reason to think about doing that. So what has California been doing to reduce plastics? For years, they've attempted to curb plastics in the state. In 2015, they banned plastic microbeads and personal care products such as toothpaste and facial scrubs. I can remember them doing that. And last year, they prohibited the use of single-use plastic utensils and condiment packages from restaurants and less requested by the customer. And I see that frequently, that that's working. Uh, and they hope to reduce single-use plastic packaging by 25% by 2023. Uh, I found a lot of times they put together these art installations with plastics to bring attention to the topic. And I especially like the one at the Monterey Bay Aquarium of the whale so that people can learn that every nine minutes, 300,000 pounds of plastic the weight of a blue whale makes its way into the oceans. This is the State Water Resources Control Board's microplastics website. Um, they have fantastic uh, articles from the beginning of uh, the regulations and, and uh, their public uh, press releases. And I would recommend that anybody interested in following up on 
on microplastics, go to this website. You can find it by just doing DDW plastics and it'll take you there and search. Here is their proposed definition of microplastics in drinking water. Uh, they're defined as solid polymeric materials to which chemical additives or other substances may have been added, which are particles which have at least two dimensions that are greater than one and less than 5,000 micrometers. And then they make a point that polymers that are derived in nature that have not been chemically modified <coughs> are excluded. And evidence concerning the toxicity and exposure of humans to microplastics is nascent. I had to look it up, just coming into existence and beginning to display signs of future potential and rapidly evolving, which is quite true. The proposed definition is subject to change and it's gonna change in response to advances in analytical techniques and or standardization of analytical methods. California eLab uh, was the first in the world to offer accreditation for microplastics testing in a response to requests from DDW. They updated uh, these six methods um, for analysis of microplastics. And you can see the basic difference uh, are the sizes. And um, I have a little bit more on some of the technical side of how they test for microplastics. Related to the state's uh, DDW's plastics website, there are, are a lot of references to the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project's website. And they've done a lot of work. Uh, up in the upper left was a webinar, uh, the findings from microplastics in the drinking water work group. And this was presented by Dr. Scott Coffin, who is the State Water Board's subject matter expert for microplastics. And you could spend hours just talking about what he's talking about. He has his own website. And it's really interesting to look at some of these presentations. <coughs> Excuse me, they're all available for review. They've had a lot of health effects workshops. And they're putting together a microplastics toxicity database where they'll take in all the uh, known and you know, still being developed toxicity data, put it into different categories, and then users can come and search through it and, and pull out the information that they need. And I thought that their graph or picture of of how this works. Somebody put a lot of time into that. I thought their logo was really good. So I put in one slide to just give people a, a better example of how many people are pulling together quite a bit of information. The San Francisco Bay had a microplastics project for three years. It's got a 402 page report. <clears throat> well worth reading. Um, all these reports have just a tremendous amount of data. So you can see, you could just spend an hour talking about this report and not even cover everything that the one report covers. But they do have a brilliant nine page executive summary if you want to just see something that kind of condenses what they found. But basically, uh, it gives the details on how they found microparticles and microplastics in all the storm water, treated wastewater, surface water, sediment, and prey fish they studied. All of them, every single one. And they're continuing to learn about sample collection. That's a real challenge in of itself to not introduce any plastics into your sample collections. Laboratory analysis, what quality assurance, quality control steps need to be in place methods and different types of particle classification. But I think that's a, a excellent report that, you know, if you're interested in the topic, maybe that's something you want to follow up on. Just last week, EPA has had this trash free waters webinar series. 
And I looked in on this bioplastics, the good, the bad, and the band-aids, because I thought the title was kind of cool. And so they went into a lot of detail about substitutes for plastics. Uh, is there you know, some way that we can move a, away from the toxicity and introduce things that are more uh, biologically favorable? Uh, maybe they degrade, maybe they, you know, don't have the toxic side effects. And so these webinars are all available on EPA's website. So once you get interested in plastics, there's just so many directions that you can go to learn more. I just wanted to point out a couple of the resources. Now let's take a look at some costs. Plastics pollution in both its visible and more deadly invisible forms, including micro and nanoplastics, is costing society hundreds of billions of dollars every year in medical treatment, environmental cleanup, and harm to the natural world. The cost is comparable to the revenue of the entire plastics industry, $600 billion in 2021. What liabilities have their historical emissions left them exposed to? And what are they doing to reduce then eliminate the burden of toxic plastic pollution while at the same time they're profiting from its harm? <clears throat> and I just leave that as kind of a rhetorical question. Many of us have been unaware of its magnitude and how extensive the damage already is. And I certainly feel that way. If I really hadn't been wanting to share some of what I was learning with everyone here, I wouldn't have been as aware as now I am uh, about how bad of a problem this is. The policy handbook the State Water Resources Control Board adopted lays out a timeline for the testing ahead. After an initial year-long pilot phase to test and hone sampling methods and provide training, monitoring is expected to take place in two two-year phases. Water systems will be required to alert the public to microplastic detections in their annual consumer confidence reports. The Water Board standardized testing method is estimated to cost water systems between $1,000 and $2,000 per sample. Uh, that's a big number. I don't usually pay $2,000 per sample. This is a testing that these larger agencies are going to have to pay for. There's no money right now coming to pay for that sampling. I wanted to share a little bit about the DDW method study to get kind of more in depth with how are these analyzed, how are they different from other tests that occur on drinking water. So they did a method study uh, with 22 labs to assess the precision, repeatability, cost, and other factors. Uh, the methods for sampling, extraction via filtering or sieving, optical microscopy, infrared spectroscopy, and Raman spectroscopy, I knew this was gonna happen. Spectroscopy were evaluated, <clears throat> excuse me. Each laboratory received three spike samples of simulated clean water in a laboratory blank. The spike samples contain known amounts of microplastics in four size fractions. And those are the size fractions going from smaller to larger. They were four different polymer types, and those are the four different polymer types. And they had six colors, and those are the six colors. The spike samples also included false positives, like natural hair, fibers, and shells. They could be mistaken for microplastics to kind of make it more challenging to make sure that they were really just detecting the microplastics. And overall, the participants demonstrated excellent average recovery and chemical identification for particles greater than 20 micrometers and 50 micrometers in size. The smaller ones were using the Raman spectroscopy and the larger ones, the infrared spectroscopy. <clears throat> and there was a lot of opportunity for increased accuracy and precision through training and further method refinement. And I put just a picture of one of the pieces of equipment up there. So 
I wanted to review some of the topics I said I wanted to cover in the beginning. Um, I wanted to give you some basic background on the subject of plastics, some of the health effects, uh, some of the costs involved and the size of the problem. And I hope that after going through these uh, slides that you have a better understanding of, of just those general categories. And that is the conclusion of my presentation. And I think if anybody has questions, we could answer some questions now. You feel feel free to um, uh, you know um, ask Sue questions directly, or if you'd prefer, you can uh, add the questions to the chat, and I um, and I'll be happy to read them. I was just going to say it was interesting that the the report that you showed on the cover they had a plastic container holding all that debris, and it's like you know they could have put it in a glass container with a steel <laughs> lid. <laughs> like you know this is about you know plastic waste. Why are we still using plastic jars like? Well, they're the reusing them. Yeah, they're reusing break. them. Oh, yeah, yeah. Reuse it a million times. Every time <laughs> you open and close it, microplastics going to be shredded and it's going to get into our water and I'm going to eat it in my broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, my, my awareness was really raised. And so during one week, I just took a look at how many times I was intersecting with plastics. I couldn't believe it, you know, at the supermarket, at everything I drank and I was just like, yikes, I can't get away from this stuff. I try so hard to, but it, it is basically impossible. I, my only hope is that we uh, start finding a way to convert all this plastic into energy. And then like there was a, uh, in this video, we went to, I went to this plastic thing and they talked about the air or the, the, the Navy has like this device that can actually burn the plastic to such a like a finite level that it's now benign and it's it's like turns into almost like dust or some sort of like uh you know just something that's safe and and that's kind of my hope is that we'll find a way to turn plastic into something that people want to and it's going to be in demand and then they'll be collecting it from all of the pollution that's everywhere well it's just amazing i heard one statistic that in by 25, 30 more years, there's, there's going to be more plastic in the ocean than fish. And so the, the sheer size of the problem and, and all the dumps and the waste and, you know, they're going to have to have like thousands of those incinerators, <laughs> you know, send it to the sun or I don't know, uh, looking at microorganisms that might be able to eat the plastics. I know that they're is a lot of uh, research going on as to how we can improve our water treatment plants to capture these extremely small particles. We it's have a, and, and, and we actually have a question that's related to that, um, it, which is, you know, how, um, how, um, how are, um, especially water, water wastewater treatment systems um, uh, adapting to um, removing increasingly small um, microplastics? Uh, I took a little look at uh, some of the suggestions that will have to be upgrades once they get occurrence data. And in the past, they usually got occurrence data by the UCMR process. But this was so important, I think, that it kind of got its own process. And as soon as they have occurrence data, you know, they took them a while to develop the methodology to test for it. That's always a challenge. And to, if you're not testing, you just don't know what the level of whatever chemical is in, in your system. It'll it, it, it'll call for a lot of upgrades in treatment, very expensive ones. There's another question here, Sue, is uh, are they talking about how to remove and dispose of microplastics once detected? I haven't seen too much on that yet. It seems like we're still kind of at the beginning of the process. Let's get a current data. Let's find out, you know, how much is out there. I know 
in our area, we primarily use two sources of water. Uh, we have the water from Lake Berryessa, uh, and we have the state project water from North Bay Aqueduct. And the North Bay Aqueduct intake structure is down gradient from the SAC Regional Wastewater Plant. So the wastewater plants, as part of their discharge permits, are probably you know going to have to do more to remove these smaller and smaller. I mean, as technology increases and our ability to analyze smaller and smaller particles gets better, we're just still learning a lot. Okay. James uh, asks, are biodegradable containers plastic free? Well, that's a good question. I'm suspicious, <laughs> but uh, I in that webinar that I watched from EPA, there were still particles of concern in even things that are labeled as biodegradable. But uh, paper products, glass, some of the things that we used to use, you know, back in grandma's time, uh, we might find being used again. One of the things I can remember is we always drank soda out of glass bottles. And I liked it because it's unreactive and you took them back to the store and you recycled them. One of the things I came across consistently in looking at materials for the presentation is that there's really very, very little recycling occurring at all. You know, I think it was less than 10%. And so even though something might say biodegradable, uh, I'd have to look into it. That's a good question. I'm writing it down. You know, you mentioned about the glass bottles and the soda. It makes me wonder about garbage bags. Like, did people, you know, back in the 1900s, did they just not have garbage bags and it was just a steel can and you just, just dumped it in, right? I wish, <laughs> I mean, that's, it'd be crazy to go back to that. I've been using biodegradable bags. That's kind of why I asked that question about the yeah. biodegradable actually being free yeah, plastic. I recently bought some non-plastic bags for food waste. And yeah, you, when I was growing up, which is long ago, uh, you just put the garbage directly, maybe in a paper bag into the garbage can and the garbage man came up and got your can and emptied it and put it back. So you didn't have to. <laughs> I, I like That's that right. service. So we're trying to reduce, you know, use. I'm certainly made some changes in my own life as far as uh, minimizing uh, when I purchase things, uh, extra and extra packaging and reusing materials when I can. It'd be cool to see some statistics about how COVID affected plastic use because it seemed like as soon as COVID hit, everything was you know disposable. We had to have everything in plastic, and they weren't even allowing me to bring in my containers. I used to try to take my containers to the restaurants I'd order food from and have them put it in my containers and then reuse it. And they were like, "No, we can't touch your stuff. We can't even be near you. Get away!" And everything went really crazy. Plastic, I thought during COVID, I'd love to see some statistics about the increase in plastic usage because of the pandemic well the marketing the the money spent on marketing is just i mean the industry is huge and like i think of it as the early days of the tobacco industry you know that the industry needs to be finding solutions to what they're doing that they need to be part of the process and kind of this cradle to grave idea that if you produce it, then you're responsible for it all the way through the process. And uh, I don't know why it had to get to this point before it attracted the attention that it's now attracting. I mean, it's a combination of things that the sheer buildup and then also the technology available to test for things. But I think as usual, often California is really ahead of the curve and leading the country and the world in some of the decisions that we make in an environmental way. 
There's a question and a comment here that's worth considering. Um, what are some ways to work with the plastic industry to reduce plastics? And then there's a comment about discarded masks are everywhere. I know. I know. One of the first questions I got from my son was, are those biohazards on the ground over there? You know, <laughs> why are there no, you know, receptacles to, to get all of this this waste? And some of the pictures that I've seen are just devastating with the sea animals and, you know, their stomachs full of plastic and them being caught up in fishing nets. And, you know, when I was looking at the big picture and the problem with plastics in the ocean, I wasn't even thinking about walking to my kitchen and getting a glass of water that might have microplastics in it at that time. So it's kind of like a lot of subjects, the more you learn, the more your awareness is raised. And that was my hope today was to just let some other people kind of see the path that I took and some of the things that are available. And then next year, the Bay work can be all about, you know, the solutions to the problem. <laughs> I'm much more interested now, even for our treatment plants on a smaller scale, uh, what we're going to have to do, because as soon as they find all this in the larger utilities, which 30 of the largest providers provide a lot of people, but there's, you know, 7,000 other public water systems, you know, throughout the state that are also having the same challenges. There's another, point, there's another question um, here, Sue. Um, have you encountered any studies or methods of detecting microplastics slash PFASs in lubricants for industrial equipment? And that and that's related to sort of one of the, one of my questions about the role of the petrochemical industry um, and uh, uh, and whether the, the pressures that they're under from an environmental perspective. Will, be, will align with some of these goals around microplastics in water? I haven't seen much in, in from, you know, even my recent, you know, more and more awareness of the negativity reflected by the customers uh, to that industry. It might seem overwhelming because we're talking, you know, about the humongous industry and They've just year after year come out with new and new products. And then they kind of change the name. And for instance, uh, uh, bisphenol A uh, was determined to be a real problem in some of the containers. So they substituted it with other compounds and now they market it as a BPA free. But it turns out some of the other compounds that they substituted are have greater problems than the original ones. So I, I don't know what is going to be a combination of factors, the public awareness, the regulations, the testing to, to you know, be able to prove that this is a, a problem. Any other questions or comments? How are we doing on time? We have a, we have a few more minutes um, and certainly want to leave um, time for uh, people to um, ask questions and at the same time uh, before people start dropping off, wanted to just point out that I've added into the chat a link for people to give their feedback on this presentation. Uh, just, uh, it's, a sur it's a survey monkey survey tool should take you less than five minutes to complete the survey. Um, you'll also get uh, an email um, uh, uh, later today um, or tomorrow um, reminding you to complete the survey. So if you don't do it, if you don't get the link today, you, um, right now, you'll get it later today in an email. Any other questions? I got another comment. Uh, I'll throw out there that I actually saw uh, an opportunity to get a metal credit card you know, you mentioned the credit card, that's how much we consume a day or something, that's a scary thought, but I was super excited that uh, one of my banks uh, was actually like sending out metal credit cards. Cause you know, you get a new one of those every few years, definitely not the biggest plastic waste that we probably each use, you know, but 
Yeah, one less thing of plastic. I was pretty excited about that. Oh, th I'm glad you shared that. And I'm going to ask Wells Fargo if, if they have that available because we didn't talk too much about the dermal absorption, but a lot of these um, beauty and care products have the micro uh, beads in them. Um, and so every time that we touch plastic, we're having a opportunity to absorb it through our skins and any cuts that we have in our skins. And I mean, I can't wait to learn more about this myself. And I appreciate the opportunity to, to share what I have learned because it's just in, given me some incentive to continue to follow up on this. And I really want to spend some time on, you know, what are the treatment options? Thank you for bringing awareness to all this. Definitely, uh, it's good to bring to share that awareness. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody, and I hope you have a great day. And you know, try to cut down on your use of plastics. And uh, and thank you again, Sue, for um, sharing your um, your wisdom with us. Um, and thank you to all of our um, uh, participants today. Uh, we have three more sessions left today, um, one starting here in a few minutes at 11 o'clock and then two more this afternoon. Um, and so um, feel free to go to the baywork.org website uh, to uh, register for those last remaining three. Um, and, um, and don't forget to um, complete the survey um, that's in the chat. That gives us um, valuable information on what we should be offering um, uh, at the next training buffet next fall. Thanks, everybody.